We give you another warm word of welcome to another Tuesday night in the Psalms. Tonight we're in Psalm 138. Psalm 138. We give you all a warm word of welcome. And please remember that at 8.45 or thereabouts, the Zoom will be open uh, for the online season of prayer. And we hope to start that at 9 sharp. Uh, for 25 minutes or half an hour or so. We trust that you'll be able to join us for that. But let's turn to the scriptures. And it's Psalm 138. <coughs> Just a couple of things by way of announcement before we read and then pray together. Uh, some people from our church family have been inquiring about giving to the church financially and supporting the work that way. Uh, you can forward anything on to the treasurer and uh, you can contact him and he'll be able to give you uh, details as well for setting up online banking, if you so desire. There's no pressure about that, but we are encouraged that some are thinking about the needs of the church in a material sense, and you can contact myself or uh, some of the elders, or certainly the treasurer would be the one that would be able to help you directly. Please remember the online ministry as it continues, and uh, the devotions and the services go on over Facebook, YouTube. You can also access, access them via Twitter and Instagram and also through our own church website. And again, a word of thanks to the media team for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalm 138, we will read from verse number one. Now, this is a psalm that we're not uh, enlightened as to the background of the psalm or the context of its being written. The title is just very simply a psalm of David. So therefore we clearly know that David was the author of the psalm, but we do not know how old David was or where he was or what his circumstances were as he wrote this psalm. And yet it's a wonderful, wonderful portion of scripture that has got great relevance to us living in this day and in this generation. Verse 1 Psalm 138, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cried, thou answeredst me and strengthenedst me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord. When they hear the words of thy mouth, yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. And we know that the Lord will bless the reading of his precious word. Our text for tonight is found at the beginning of verse number 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Let's pray and ask God for his help. Father, we thank thee again tonight for thy word. We thank thee for this precious book that we have, the only book that God has ever given. As I read, God speaks to me. I see Christ and Calvary, the wonderful word of God. We pray tonight that the spirit of faith would come down and reveal the things of God Make to us the Godhead known and witness with the blood. Pray tonight, O God, that thou wilt be pleased, Lord, to do a great work in our hearts and in our lives and lead us on to know thee in a deeper and in a fuller way. Remember the time of prayer a little bit later on. We pray for thy blessing to rest upon that. Continue with us now. We humbly ask in the Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Very often, whenever we think about the subject of revival, which is a subject that we should think upon, we often think about it in a national sense. And certainly our land is in great need of revival. 
Sometimes when we think of revival, we think of swathes and swathes of men and women and young people coming to the Savior and coming to the cross and entering into newness of life and being converted. And we long for that in this day and generation. And then sometimes when we think about revival, we think about it in an ecclesiastical sense. We think of the church and its great need for an awakening and its great need for God to come with revival blessing, even amongst His own people, because revival, in a very real sense, is God moving amongst His people. But maybe one area that we neglect whenever we think about revival is perhaps the most important area of revival, because in a sense, it's where all revival begins, personal revival. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 57, and verse number 15, we read these words, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones." personal revival. And David here in Psalm 138 and verse number 7 is speaking also about personal revival. Maybe tonight your need and my need is personal, and it's the need for personal and individual revival. David says, "'Though I walk in the midst of trouble,' Thou wilt revive me. I want to speak for a little while tonight about personal revival in perilous times. Personal revival in perilous times. Will you look at, first of all, David's personal consideration? David's personal consideration. Our text begins with the words, Though I, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. David here is considering where he is as a believer, and he's also considering how he is as a believer. David's personal consideration. Can I challenge you tonight to think about where you are and how you are as a Christian? The Bible exhorts us to do that. Thus saith the Lord, consider thy ways. The prophet Haggai said that twice. Consider thy ways. And the Word of God in the little book of James is likened unto a mirror. And as we come to the Word of God, we are to see and examine ourselves in the light of Holy Scripture. And then whenever we come to break bread together and to partake of the cup together, to remember the Lord's death and to anticipate His coming, even before we do that, the Bible says, let a man examine himself. Jeremiah says, let us, let us search our ways, search our hearts, and return again to God. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. There is a time for personal consideration. Now here, David is considering where he is. Do I walk in the midst of trouble? David is in the midst of trouble. That's where he is. Now, whenever Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord in the midst of the garden amongst the trees, God came to them and asked them, Where art thou? I wonder where you are tonight in a spiritual sense. God spoke to Elijah, who was very lethargic and tired and weary and depressed, and spoke to him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? David is considering where he is. He's also assessing how he is. Do I walk in the midst of trouble? Thou wilt revive me. David's acknowledging here his need for personal reviving. That indicates that David, maybe in a physical sense or a spiritual sense, is feeling tired and weak and lethargic. Is that how you are tonight? Maybe in life and with all of the circumstances around us tonight. You're weak, you're weary, you're tired, and you're lethargic. And you're maybe not in the place of God where you ought to be. David's personal consideration. Notice, secondly, David's problematic circumstances. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, 
walking in the midst of trouble. Do you see there his tribulation? That word trouble, it just means trial, difficulty, tribulation. And David says, that's where I am. I'm in the midst of trouble. Now, if you look at the life of David, even just a cursory glance and a fleeting reading over the Scriptures, and you read about David's life from beginning to end, there were many, many troubles in the life of David. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. And right from a lad of 17, as David was out there and he was tending to the flock, even before that, we read about the lion and the bear taking a lamb out of the flock. We read about Goliath taunting the armies of Israel. We read about David going to prove Saul's armor. We read about Eliab, his eldest brother, accusing him of all sorts of things. We read about David standing before Goliath and all of the armies of Israel behind him, and he stands alone. Later on, we read about trouble that David made for himself whenever he numbered the people, and whenever he sinned with Bathsheba. We read about the trouble with Saul's jealousy. We read about the uprising of Absalom, and David in his lifetime faced many, many troubles. I believe we're living in days of trouble nationally. I believe there are days of trouble for the church. And maybe you're facing trouble individually. His tribulation. Notice also his location. Do I walk in the midst of trouble? David's not saying, you know, there's trouble looming on the horizon. I'm going to have to face it sooner or later. David doesn't say, well, I'm walking in a, a plain path now, but there's trouble to the left and there's trouble to the right, and there might be trouble coming behind. David says, I am right in the very midst of trouble. I'm right in the eye of the storm. A lot like the disciples in Matthew chapter 14, whenever they got into a ship and they crossed the Sea of Galilee, and the storm of wind arose, and the Bible says that the little boat that they were in the ship was in the midst of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed right there in the midst, right in the very center of the Sea of Galilee, and there was really nowhere for them to go. They were as far from one shore as they were from the other. They were in the midst of trouble. Sometimes we can feel like that, can't we? We think about the crisis in our land, maybe some of the problems that we have in our homes, maybe problems that we have with our health and circumstances. We think about the future. How is that going to work out? We think about our circumstances around us, maybe things that are coming behind us, and we feel, this is my location, my situation. I'm right in the very midst of trouble. But did you notice as well his determination? David says, though I walk in the midst of trouble. David doesn't say, I'm going to lie down to this. I'm going to throw the towel in. I'm going to give up. No, David says, I'm walking. I'm still walking with God in the midst of all of my trouble. This is determination. It's perseverance. The Bible says, be steadfast and unmovable. And David is showing that steadfast, unmovable spirit. Yes, there's trouble, but I'm endeavoring to walk with God. The Bible says if we endure chastisement, God dealeth with us as with sons. The Scripture says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us laying aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's endurance, it's perseverance. We read in the Bible in Genesis, and then in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and then in the little epistle of Jude about a man called Enoch. Now, Enoch lived in a very ungodly generation. The Bible speaks about the ungodly days he lived in and all of the ungodliness round about him. And yet Enoch walked with God. We don't know much about him other than he walked with God. Everywhere he went, he was walking with God. And before God translated him that he should not see death, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, I think many people are getting so discouraged that they're getting their eyes off the Lord. But David says, I'm still walking in the midst of trouble. And I know God will come and God will revive me. I wonder how is our walk tonight? I'm thinking about myself. What about my walk? What about your walk? We often bring 
to your attention that lovely story of the Reverend Duncan Campbell whenever he arrived in the Isle of Lewis at the harbour in Stornoway to conduct what he thought would just be a short two or three week gospel mission. Ended up being in the island for three years. And one of the elders is Mr. Campbell walked up the gangplanks off the boat and into the harbour and was a little bit under the weather because of the rough sailing and the inclement weather. One of the deacons from the church says, Mr. Campbell, are you walking with God? That's all that mattered. Didn't say, Mr. Campbell, can we see your ordination papers? What are your credentials? How successful are you? What size is your congregation? How many people have you led to the Lord? Are you in demand as a speaker? What qualifications do you have? No, they just wanted to know, are you walking with God? And in the midst of our circumstances, problematic though they might be, so important that we walk with God. David's personal consideration David's personal circumstances. Notice thirdly, David's paramount concern. Revive me. For David, nothing is more important than that. David doesn't say, Lord, would you enable me to stay upon the throne in Israel? He doesn't say, Lord, would you establish my kingdom? He doesn't say, Lord, would you deal with all of my enemies? He doesn't say, Lord, would you make me popular? He doesn't say, Lord, would you give me a better salary? He doesn't say, Lord, would you make my life easier? He doesn't even say, Lord, would you take all of these problems and difficulties away? No, he says, Lord, in the midst of all this trouble, Lord, revive me. That's his paramount concern. There's nothing more important for David than that, than personal revival in perilous times. For David, this was something imperative. Revive me. Now, the word revive comes from a Greek verb which means to be alive, to keep alive, or even to make alive. Somebody once said revival is the inrush of new life into a body that threatens to become a corpse. And it's as if David here is saying, Lord, I am in the midst of trouble, but Lord, will you sustain my physical life? Lord, will you sustain my spiritual life? Keep me alive, Lord. Give me new life and new vigor and new vitality in the midst of all of my trouble. Do you ever feel that you're in danger of dying spiritually because your faith has been so attacked? Do you ever feel that your faith is not what it ought to be and it's getting weak? Do you ever look at the troubles all around you and think, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to keep walking and keep my eyes upon the Lord? How am I going to stay strong and victorious as a Christian with all of these perilous times and and problems and difficulties all around us? The lockdown, maybe there's problems in your family as a result of it. Maybe there's problems in your business as a result of it. And you're worried, you're afraid, and you're anxious. And you feel so weak and so lethargic and maybe so worried and you think, Am I really going to make it? Is my spiritual life going to be sustained? David's paramount concern was his spiritual life, his spiritual vitality. And that's why he says, revive me. This is something imperative. It's also something individual. Revive me. David doesn't say, Lord, would you send a great revival to your land? I think he does that on other occasions. He doesn't even say, Lord, would you revive your people? He doesn't point the finger at others and say, Lord, they're so backslidden and they're so cold at heart. And Lord, he's got issues and she's got issues and there's a problem over there. But David recognizes that this is something that concerns me. Revive me. We can be so guilty. I can be so guilty of looking at the problems in our land and the problems in our parliament or the problems in our government or the problems in our church. And we can be guilty, can't be, of pointing the finger at other people and thinking, well, they need revived and they need restored and they need a closer walk with God and they need to pull their socks up spiritually and they need to get to a prayer meeting and they need to be reading more of the Bible and they need to be doing more for God. But what about me? What about my heart? What about my life? What about my walk with God? Do I not need personal revival today? Yes, I do. Before Duncan Campbell saw revival in Lewis, God had to revive his heart. For several years, he had been a minister 
in the United Free Church of Scotland. He had become very popular as a conference speaker, and he testified himself that he had become very proud as a result of that, proud that he was well-known, proud that he had seen God move in places like Skye and the Highlands of Scotland, proud that he was speaking at all of these conventions and meetings all over the British Isles and in other places as well. And yet in the circles that he was moving in, there were people who had succumbed to modernistic thinking and trends. And he himself testified that he had been influenced by some of them and was beginning to question some of his orthodoxy and even some important doctrines in the Bible. And then one day, he was sitting in the study, and his daughter came in, and she was a godly young woman. And as they were talking, she, she sat before him, and she says, Daddy, you have changed. You're different. When was the last time you led a soul to Jesus? And his heart was broken and smitten. And whenever she left, he just lit the fire in his study and lay down before it and began to pray on his knees, on his face before God, that God would restore the years that the locusts had eaten, that God would make again the marred vessel. And as he wrestled with God, he got through to God, and God did something in his own heart that night that changed his life. He left that ministry. He went back into the ranks of the faith mission. It wasn't long before he was in the Isle of Lewis, and God moved mightily in a wonderful, wonderful way. You see, he realized my paramount concern is the need for personal revival. It's something imperative. It's something that's individual. David's personal consideration, problematic circumstances, paramount concern. Lastly, notice his positive confidence. Do I walk in the midst of trouble? Thy wilt revive me. Now, while there's a time for personal consideration, there's also a time to get your eyes off yourself and get them onto the Lord. David said, I will lift mine eyes onto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. You know, if you're like me and you look into your heart, I don't see anything there that's going to help me. As I look at my track record as a Christian, as I look at my past, as I look at my faults and my feelings and my lack of ability, I don't see much to encourage me there. I just see things that need to be set in order. But whenever I get my eyes off myself and I look to the heavens and I look to the cross and I look to the Lord and I look to the promises of Scripture, I see light at the end of the tunnel and I see hope. And David has this positive confidence, God's going to come and revive me. In the midst of trouble, I can experience personal revival in perilous times. Now, as we look at this portion, you'll notice something of the way of personal revival. That little word revive there is many times the exact same Hebrew word is translated quicken in our English Bible. And it's translated quicken many times in Psalm 119. For example, in verse number 25, the same word that's here, revive, is translated quicken, where the psalmist prays, quicken thou me according to thy word. Personal revival will come as we get into the Scriptures and as God, by His Spirit, applies the Word of God to our lives. And the Word of God takes on a new meaning and it becomes real in our hearts. There will never be real, authentic, genuine revival personally, ecclesiastically, or nationally if it's not according to the Scriptures. We can never have real revival outside of the Word of God. It always has to be according to His Word. Verse number 40 of Psalm 119, Quicken me in thy righteousness. Verse 88, Quicken me after thy loving kindness. Lord, this is about your word. This is about your righteousness. And Lord, your loving kindness. Lord, because you love me. Lord, would you quicken me? Because your son shed his blood for me upon a cross. I ought not to live a defeated, backslidden experience as a Christian. Lord, in your loving kindness, in your righteousness, according to your word. Or verse 149, according to thy judgment. Quicken me. Revive me, even here in the midst of trouble, by means of all of these avenues, by your Spirit, Lord. Come and quicken me. Come and revive me. 
You know, I, I would love to think that during this time of trouble, that many of God's people are praying for personal revival. And they're not wasting the crisis, but rather they're getting into the Word of God. They're thinking about His righteousness, His loving kindness. They're praying that God will revive them. You see, these, this is the way of personal revival. And then there's also the why of personal revival. Psalm 143, verse 11, Quicken me or revive me for thy name's sake. For thine honor, Lord, for thy glory. Not so that I can have a comfortable life. Not so that I can be joyous and happy and free from trial and strife and trouble. Or not so that I can look successful. But Lord, for your name's sake, for your honor, for your glory. Lord, revive me. Lord, surely it would bring more glory to thy mighty and glorious name. If I was to be revived in my heart and strengthened with might in the inner man and filled with the Spirit of God and was to be able to rise above everything around me to live for you and to walk with you and to glorify you because man's chief end, his primary purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And if I'm not in personal revival, I'm not enjoying God the way I should. I'm not glorifying God the way I should. That's the why of personal revival. And then there's also the when of personal revival. When can David expect God to revive? My thinking and expect God to do it at any moment in his life. Because we look at David and we see here a confession of need. I need this. He's confessing his need for it. In verse number 3, He's praying for it in the day when I cried, Thou answeredst me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. Personal revival comes about whenever there's confession of our need for it. Whenever we cry unto God for it. Verse number 6, whenever there's humility. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. If my people which are called by my name humble themselves, and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, and seek my face. Then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sin. Then will I heal their land. You'll notice in verse 1 and 2 that there's also praise and worship in the midst of his trouble. David doesn't allow his troubles to rob him of that joy of worshiping God. Because whatever happens in life, COVID-19 or otherwise, God is always worthy of praise and worship and glory. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods, gods there's got a small g. That really means the mighty men of this earth. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I'm going to do it publicly. I'm not going to hide my light under a bushel. I'm not going to allow the ungodly to rob me of my song and my desire to worship. And I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For you've magnified your word above your very name. May God come and revive our hearts today. These are troublesome times and difficult times. But we can experience personal revival in perilous times. May it be so, though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Let's just pray before we meet together for prayer. Father, bless thy word. Write it upon our hearts. Revive us collectively, individually. Lord, revive this heart of mine personally. O God, hear and answer prayer. We ask it for thy sake, in the name of thy Son, and for thine eternal glory. Amen.